Hey, it's Patrick here from Kintsugi Hope. It is so brilliant to be with you um, from my home to yours. And um, a lot of people say to me, what on earth does the word Kintsugi mean? Well, if you take a bowl and you mend it with super glue, I, I broke this, well, my daughter broke this the other day, and I mended it a bit with super glue. You might be able to tell the crack. But the whole idea of super glue is that we try and hide the cracks. We try and pretend that it's okay. So what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique. And the whole thing about Kintsugi Hope is believing that beauty comes from brokenness. That our scars aren't there to be ashamed of. Our scars make us who we are. So two years ago now, um, uh, after going through a really tough time myself, uh, me and my wife Diane, we formed this charity called Kintsugi Hope. And we really wanted to tackle two issues, mental health and social isolation, which are two of our biggest issues of our time. And so what we did is we actually wrote a, like a 12 week um, program, a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, but for well-being. So we looked at things like uh, in our program, we looked at anger and self-acceptance and perfectionism and anxiety and, and honesty and resilience. And we did this 12 step program uh, and it gets delivered in small groups, small groups that meet in pubs and in prisons and in coffee shops and in schools and in home groups and life groups. And we trained the church up to run these groups. And it has been absolutely incredible. It's just taken off, a movement has started across our country. It's so humbling. But of course the coronavirus hit and then we're like, oh no, what do we do now? And, uh, and so people are like, well, we could start it on Zoom. And, and to be honest, I was a little bit suspicious because um, I know it's not the same, but it is all we've got. But it has worked incredibly well. And we've moved all our training online now. So we are signing churches up every single week. And it is amazing that churches can still reach the lonely and the broken in their community. In fact, communities seem to be more connected than ever. There's WhatsApp groups in roads and streets and communities. And, and it's so easy to go, you know, do you want to join this wellbeing group for 12 weeks? And uh, we're going to look at how we can get through this together. So please pray for us. Um, we really, really need it. Um, it's really hard for charities at the moment. The other thing we do is we try and give um, resources away. I've written two books, Honesty Over Silence and When Faith Gets Shaken. And we're giving these at cost price. Um, if I could give them free, I would. Um, just because the themes, this looks at emotional, mental health. Um, and this is obviously when faith gets shaken. God, where are you when suffering happens? And so if you want these for yourself or friends, you can get them off our website at cost price. Um, and uh, we'd love you to be able to be blessed by that. But I wanted to talk to you today about anxiety. And the first thing I want to say is this. Anxiety isn't weakness. I think so often there's this, uh, uh, people think that if you're anxious that you're a weak person, it's simply not true. A friend of mine describes anxiety like this. He says it's a bit like a car alarm and we need car alarms. And in fact, all of us have anxiety. In fact, God made us with anxiety, right? And uh, the challenge is if the car alarm is going off all the time, it's a bit annoying. It's a bit annoying for you and for everyone else. And sometimes when we really struggle with anxiety, we're super sensitive. It's like the car alarm's going off all the time. And so somehow it's like, how do we manage our anxiety in a way that is um, okay for those uh, around us and for ourselves as well? You know, when I was writing On the Stay Over Silence, I did a chapter on anxiety and I remember um, I read all the technical books, um, all the theologians, all the psychologists, and it was, it was all very technical, fight or flight or freeze and, and all that stuff, it's all good stuff. But I felt, you know, that's not how anxiety feels to me. So I, I did a bit of a list of what I felt that anxiety feels. See if you can relate to any of these. Um, anxiety is your brain not being able to turn off. Anxiety is the unanswered text message that kills us inside. Uh, especially WhatsApp, um, because you, can't, you can tell it's been read, right? It believes every negative scenario you come up with. It's the inaccurate conclusions drawn as your mind takes off and you have no choice to follow its lead. It's apologising for things that don't require you to say sorry. It's self-doubt and a lack of confidence. It's trying to fix something that isn't a problem. It's the fear of failure and then striving for perfection, then beating yourself up when you don't get there. It tells you you're wrong. They don't like you. It's constantly asking the what-if questions. But I needed a definition. I like a good definition. 
and uh, and I didn't know how to find one because none of them were doing it for me. And then I came across this and I thought, oh my goodness, this is me. It says this, more than anything else, anxiety is caring. It's never wanting to hurt someone's feelings. It's never wanting to do something wrong. More than anything, it's the want and the need to be accepted and like. So you try too hard sometimes. I thought, that's me, I try too hard sometimes. Even in the last, uh, since I've been on lockdown, you know, the pressure to homeschool my kids, I've got four. Um, the pressure to make it right for them, the pressure to run a charity. And I'm just trying so hard that actually for a lot of us, you know, we, we need to be careful. We're close to burnout. We can't keep carrying on like this. Um, most anxiety roots, Carl Vernon says, they've actually got themselves root in the fear of death and the fear of approval. Um, I'm not gaining approval. You know, how many times have I got a headache and I've gone to Dr. Google for a diagnosis? Anyone else done that? And, uh, and I, you know, I've got, darn, I've got a headache. And I, I went to Dr. Google and I think I've got a brain tumour. And she's like, have you taken some paracetamol? And uh, a fear of death is real, isn't it? How many times have we, over the last uh, couple of months, have gone, oh my goodness, I've got a cough, I've got a temperature. Have I got it? I, I don't know. And we start to get really, really stressed about it. Um, approval. We worry about what other people think of us. We can go on social media at this time and it feels like everyone's writing a book or doing a garden or doing this. And I'm thinking to myself, crikey, I can't do any of that. I'm struggling and exhausted to get through the day. I've actually come to the conclusion that depression, anxiety, panic attacks are not signs of weakness. They're signs of trying to remain strong for too long. I believe we can overcome our anxiety. I think we learn to manage it, actually. And I guess some people get healed to it. For me, it's a daily choice. I think we can forge new mental pathways. And, uh, and if you go online, you'll see there'll be a nice list uh, around how to deal with anxiety, exercise, get community around you, uh, mindfulness, monitoring your thoughts, CBT, um, gratitude. All those things are true. But I wanted to choose something which uh, I know has had the biggest effect on my life and something I'm still working through. And it's this whole area of compassion. I think the way to get through this is self-compassion and com the compassion of others. You know, life doesn't always work out the way we think it's going to. There is no greater example than that in the Bible than the story of Elijah. You know, Elijah after Carmel, you probably know the story well. You know, he's defeated the prophets of Baal. Um, there's been this massive, massive fight and many of them have been wiped out. And uh, and I guess at that point, Elijah must have thought this was the climax, you know, book tour. It's all going to be great. Um, and yet, actually, Jezebel comes along, the evil queen of the time, and says, actually, I'm going to kill you. She puts a death warrant out on his head and he runs for his life and he's petrified. Life hasn't worked out the way he thought it was going to. And isn't that true? Test results do come back with terrifying news. People do um, die of coronavirus or get coronavirus. Um, marriages do break down. Relationships are complex. People do lose their jobs. And Elijah gets in this pit. And when 1 Kings 19 verse 4, he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I don't want to live anymore. He couldn't see the bigger picture. He'd lost hope. And I think it's really interesting how God then deals with him. He doesn't give him a pep talk. You know, the angel came to him and said, cheer up, Elijah. Just think of all those people who are worse off than you. I'm not sure why he's got an accent now. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then he says, you know, come on, Elijah. Think of the good old days. You remember Xenopath, the suicidal widow and the, the kid that died and got resurrected. Uh, you must remember the chair of Ravine, Elijah, when I provided meat for you with the birds uh, dropping it in your lap every couple of, uh, couple of times a day. Come on, Elijah. Cheer up a little bit. He said, you're tired. You need to rest. You need to sleep. Angels came and cared for him tenderly. And then the most beautiful bit in the Bible, I think, one of the most beautiful bits, is that God speaks to him in a whisper. In fact, the translation is probably, most theologians think, that God spoke to him in the silence. And he realises that Elijah starts to realise, you know, I'm not the only one. He thought he was the only prophet left. And in fact, Obadiah had been doing a pretty good job and there were 7,000. And sometimes, you know, we are not on our own when we struggle with this stuff. My counsellor once said to me, Patrick, you need to be more self-compassionate. And the idea of self-compassion for me was candles and bubble baths. I didn't really fancy it, to be honest. And she said, you've got the wrong idea what self-compassion is. Self-compassion and self-indulgence are two very different things. Self-indulgence may be that extra glass of wine to take the edge off, that oxa bit, bit of chocolate cake. When we found out that we were going in lockdown and with four kids at home, my wife was like, I need chocolate. 
And I was going, darling, do you remember that talk I did about self-compassion and self-indulgence being two different things? She gave me that look. Patrick, if you give me one of your speeches, I'm going to destroy you. And I had to realise that actually my point there as a husband was to listen. She was really scared. But self-compassion is this. It's talking to yourself the way that you would talk to your best friend. You see, I wouldn't dream of uh, treating my enemy, not alone my friend, the way I treat myself sometimes. Constantly beating myself up for not being enough, for um, not doing enough. Self-compassion is to be a conscious of someone's pain and to alleviate that pain with gentleness and tenderness. And self-compassion is doing that um, for yourself. So in this period of time, the challenge is how can you show a bit of self-compassion? Life is challenging. We need to acknowledge that it's okay not to be okay. We need to acknowledge anxiety isn't weakness, it is normal. We need to lament sometimes. You know, 40% of the Psalms are laments that David crying out to God. But we've got to realise that after all this is said and done, that God is still with us. Uh, my LPA, Ludovine, who still works for us, um, she came up with this word called flawsome. And the word flawsome means this, an individual who embraces their flaws and knows they're awesome regardless. I actually thought she was making a word up. And my wife said, before you criticise her, Google it. And it's there. What an amazing word. Flawsome. An individual who embraces their flaws and knows they're awesome regardless. And I want to say to you, wherever you're at today, wherever you're feeling, whether you're on top of the world uh, or you're really lonely and desperate, and actually maybe you've told no one about your anxiety and it's keeping you up at night, you're flawsome. You're loved, you're enough, and you're special. And I think God wants to say today for the story of Elijah, you are not on your own and uh, that God is with you. 